you all three of you for those wonderful talks. And I think what's really encouraging, I've, you know, this is our, every year when we come to these um, sessions, it's, it's very encouraging to see new developments. And I feel that we're very much in a sort of an exponential phase um, with brain tumors. And I'm hoping that in the next five to 10 years, we will see some incredible developments. Um, right, so we might, um, has anyone got a question to start off with? I'm not specifically aware of any work um, in breast cancer. I'm certainly aware of uh, other work in nasopharyngeal cancer. That's because the group that I work with at QIMR does that work as well, because it's interesting. That's, that's a viral associated cancer. But I can't answer that. I, I don't know if in Sydney or Melbourne there are any specific immunotherapy trials with breast cancer. Um, or other forms of cancer going on. Look, there's no question that worldwide, though, there is a lot of work going on in, in multiple fields of cancer research. I'm just curious. I found your talk very, very interesting. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yep. Uh, just... Okay. Uh, the, one of the main problems with uh, brain tumors, of course, is it's not just one one type, there's many different types. Uh, when people are doing these clinical studies, uh, the tumour types invariably taken into case so that the type of treatment can be directed towards the type of cancer, so that more in information can be gleaned, and so that other people making these studies can actually associate the type of treatment to the type of cancer or subtype. I mean, it, I mean, at the moment, um, it's all done retrospectively. Um, it's basically down to Kerry McDonald. We try to um, get her to classify the tumours molecularly, but we don't have therapies for different kinds of GBM. We know that there is at least four subtypes, if not more, but we don't have any different treatment for them. And it's something like an enzyme called MGMT, which most people in the room may or may not have heard of, um, the test costs 350 bucks to do, but if you've got it or you haven't got it, it may um, be prognostic, it may help in um, dealing with elderly people, but we treat them all the same because we don't have a different therapy. So retrospectively, yes, we want to know why did you do well, how can we subtype it, and hopefully get our colleagues to make specific drugs, but at the moment we have nothing. Uh, given the, the existence of tissue banks and such, wouldn't that be uh, low-hanging fruit for further exploration rather than having all these patients coming into these surveys, with, into these um, studies with brain cancer and not knowing what sort it is? And then, I mean, if a cure is found for a particular type of cancer, 100% more or less of those patients will be cured. But if you don't know what subtype of cancer it is, we're getting all these um, very non-specific results from these studies. Can, can I just clarify your question? I think what you're, what you're stating is that uh, perhaps out in the, you know, when you look on the internet or whatever, that there isn't enough uh, information to say what particular type of brain tumour you harbour and what, what trial targets what particular brain tumour. Whereas I think Helen was talking about subtypes of just GBM. So most trials... Are you just subtypes of GBM? I'm saying that when you go to treat a particular, when you go to study a particular type of cancer, such as a GBM, yeah. uh, you really need to know what subtype you're dealing with if you're going to get useful information from a study. And I'm just wondering what the thoughts of the. Yeah, I, th I think that the subtypes have only, it's a new, it's a, new, it's a relatively new thing. And um, we haven't had a means of testing for these subtypes uh, until fairly recently. So they haven't been characterized yet. And that's going to be the way for a long time, I think. 
Oh, I would say that, I mean, that your thoughts are, you know, very insightful, but we've all been looking at that and we've realised that that's a very important way of the future. I mean, Kerry's working on tumour banking and trying to coordinate tumour banking um, over the last few years throughout Australia, so what you're saying is what's already happening. The problem is, as Helen mentioned, is that at this early stage there's no variety of treatments that will fit even a different specific subtype. Um, but that's been worked on and that's what Kerry's laboratory is all focused on, to try to identify particular uh, molecular targets so that the, the treatment can be um, specific for each, to each individual rather than, you know, and in, in subtype of tumour. Is that a fair statement, Karen? Mm. Also, I think for BTA, um, uh, at the present time, individualised approaches using molecular markers are not supported by the government. So to get molecular testing performed is an additional out-of-pocket expense. So even one where we do have fairly strong clinical data, such as 1P19Q, that still is an out-of-pocket expense. It's not covered by standard pathological Medicare reimbursement let alone going down the pathway of MGMT testing, RDH testing, etc. cetera. Um, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to answer it, not Helen, because if Helen answers it, we'll be here for another 25 minutes. <laughs> simply, simply you need strong clinical evidence before you can uh, apply a cost to the Australian community. And I think the Australian community yes. and the government does that quite well because there's lots of interventions which can be, um, can be applied to uh, clinical practice. Quiet, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, there has to be regulation and we have to get information, which is why we should be promoting as much as possible if patients are being diagnosed with a tumour to be encouraged to ta partake on clinical trials where the testing is incorporated into the clinical trial protocol and the testing is done and the testing then educates the clinicians, educates patients for potential future treatments and, uh, after their initial primary treatment. Any other questions? <laughs> Next talk. Yeah, well, I hear about it for five years, but I've never been able to participate in any trials. How do I find out about it? Well, I think Helen's going to talk about it next. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the whole thing. But I agree, it's, a, it's actually a problem because uh, not, it's hard for patients, but, and you think that your clinician would be able to put you in touch with trials, but they often either don't know or don't care about getting involved in trials and certainly don't want to refer you on to someone else. Yeah. yeah. All right? And then there's a, well, they, there's a reluctance. It's just that when you come from the country, you, well, nobody knows about any, much of anything. So mm. you don't get told anything. Yeah. And then, I, I don't know, most, a lot of people in the room probably come from the country as well. We come to the city for our mm. three monthly, six monthly appointments and then you leave and that's all you're told. Yeah. There's a National Register of Clinical Trials, uh, which is, should be available through uh, the Cancer Institute New South Wales website. Uh, but yeah, it does predominantly come down to the clinician encouraging uh, participation in the clinical trials. And also the patient, as James mentioned, about being an advocate and being proactive in their treatment to ask that question. One of the things we were discussing in the break was exactly that. And um, most cancers that are treated in a tertiary setting where there are, um, you know, there are uh, lots of all the disciplines required for brain cancer, um, they, get, they have access to trials and we have regular meetings where people talk about what trials are available. So it's in the forefront of people's minds. Whereas if you're in a, in a more peripheral setting, that may not be the case, and so you might miss out on trials. Yeah, I just, I mean, wouldn't it be better to have someone in a clinical trial that's actually quite healthy, and, and rather than waiting until we, we're getting further down the track um, to not be able to expand all the treatments and things? I'm just going on me as a guinea pig, for instance. So yeah. I'm healthy. I yeah. get Definitely, as I've made that point before, you know, it's better to trial early. But there, there is a conservatism in, in medical uh, treatment and, and trials in particular, and that's understandable because 
in many years ago, people would just do trials and with no scientific basis, and that hurt people um, really badly. So there has to be some, you know, stages that a, a research goes through. That is from the basic science to animal studies, often, and then to patients where uh, you tried initially to make it safe, and then go on to, from there. I think, though, there is a problem with the, uh, how trials have run with glioblastoma, and I've with the focus being on phase three trials, and I've talked about this before, and I have some problem with phase three trials. I don't, sorry, Helen, if I'm taking all your talk away. <laughs> but, but because um, with phase three trials, you have to enrol a lot of people. Half of them don't get the treatment. And because you have to enrol in a lot of people, you, you, you're actually only looking for a small benefit. So I really hate them. I'd rather the focus be on early phase one trials, looking for innovative treatments rather than just poking around at the edges where most people won't get benefit at all. And they're very costly, but yeah. What is the web address for the, re the registration of clinical trials? I mean, maybe people can at least give their, Helen, is that part of your talk too? No. <laughs> is there a website that has all the Apparently, clinical trials? Yeah. Computers, so. you know Michael does. Yeah, there's a, there's a web. Yeah. It's actually a federal government site uh, that was set up, uh, but it was only set up, uh, I think, in uh, July last year, so it's a new site, but it's a federal government initiative. And so what's it called? Uh, Australian Clinical Trials or website. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, was there a question here? Yeah. Um, from the presentations we have had since this morning, I realised there are a lot of um, research and uh, advances in treatment for the uh, malignant brain tumors. I'm not sure if there's uh, any research or studies being done to improve the uh, outcomes for patients suffering from the other types of tumors like meningiomas, because it, sometimes they seem a bit neglected, yet the effects of these tumors can be so devastating to the individuals and their families. But our main focus seems to be on um, on uh, research seems to be focusing more on uh, on the more uh, aggressive tumors. I feel like I'm not sure if the, that's the opinion of the uh, of the team as well. Jacob, do you want to take this one? <laughs> I think that's a very insightful comment. Malignant tumors get most of the press. Mal I think that's a fair comment. Um, malignant tumors probably have uh, disproportionately a greater burden on the individual and society, so it seems to be the focus for research. Meningiomas, if you want to look at the biggest surgical uh, study pertaining to meningiomas, you almost have to go back 63 years to an Adelaide neurosurgeon for the Simpson study for degree of resection as one of the most informing um, uh, features for prognosis. And although we've had a lot of incremental changes since then with some chemotherapies and certainly some forms of radiation treatment for the more aggressive meningiomas, I think your comment's very, very insightful. Sorry, Kerry's just handed me the website for the clinical trials <laughs> registry, and it's australianclinicaltrials.gov.au. Pretty close. Okay, next question. <laughs> and that is that, um, how do you know that if you actually filled the form in about uh, a bit over a year ago, but I know I was too late, I think, putting it in, whether I'm actually, um, my data is actually in a study or not? Like, do we ever get feedback about what's coming out or what's um, being found? Or? I, th I think you were talking about the AGOG study that you signed up for, which ah. was when we were collecting blood and trying to get tumours on everybody. I mean, Kerry's kind of the leader of AGOG, and unfortunately you didn't get recurrent funding. So the aim with that study was to get brain tumours and blood and details of like where, <laughs> did, where were you born, did you get chicken pox mm. and how were you mm. educated um, on everyone with a brain tumour in Australia and make this really solid um, national facility for ongoing research. Um, and with the downgrading of funding, that's going to be hard to keep going. But if you signed up, you will be there 
Um, it, and when we enter data on databases like that, it's de-identified so that your maybe date of birth and initials will be in there. Um, we could potentially track you back if we had to, maybe, <laughs> but it's probably illegal. Um, and um, that is your, if you signed up for that and your blood went in and you filled in the questionnaire, that is part of a national bank um, that different researchers can apply to to facilitate their ongoing research. So you've contributed. Um, yeah, um, Kerry has the bank, um, and if there's groups um, who want to apply, I mean, the problem with things like this is there's limited tissue. We can't send samples to a thousand different sites. Um, but if the research is, is worthwhile, you could apply um, and get it for your group. Thank Kerry. You. Okay, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> follow up on that. So the, the tumour banking office in your individual sites, um, but there is also a, a bank in Melbourne that you can Um, I've just got a question in relation to the CMV virus. Um, I'm not sure if I understood it, but is it correct that it's present in all brain tumours? Um, and if so, does that mean that all people that get brain tumours have been exposed to that virus? And is there any sort of vaccine being worked on to prevent people from getting that, that, that virus? Well, all very good questions. Um, the, the cytomegalovirus, we believe, uh, not so much all brain tumours, but glioblastomas or gliomas. So I, I did say brain tumours, but I meant glioblastomas. As far as we believe, we're, as if we can do really fancy tests in the laboratory, we think that the virus or viral particles are in almost all glioblastomas spe specimens, OK? So that answers your first question. Um, the last question was about the vaccination I'll get to. What was the second question part of it? So does that mean that everyone... Oh, have you been, been exposed to... Yeah, well, in fact, factors. most of our community, um, mm -hmm. in, in Western communities, about 60, 70 per cent of people will be positive or in, just in their blood, positive for cytomegalovirus. And, and probably the most of the rest have been exposed to the virus as well. And they, and they can still get, develop brain tumours. So um, why, why it's involved in brain tumours, it's not certain. It probably doesn't cause them per se, but it may well actually speed up the growth of the, of the brain tumours via different molecular mechanisms. The proteins are involved in the cell cycle or the, how the cells turn over. And your third question about vaccination is a very good one and, and something we've thought about in Brisbane um, because, but the problem is cytomegalovirus vaccines are not available or effective ones are not available for some reason I don't really understand. It has to do with the complexity of the uh, viral makeup and the viral proteins, but it's been worked on. Um, not so much for brain tumour patients, uh, but for other conditions that cytomegalovirus causes, particularly in immunosuppressed people with um, host, or other, you know, immuno, host versus graft disease or, th or things like that, I, I believe. But in any case, it's, a, it's an important area of study. Um, I think when it, uh, an effective vaccine is going to be developed, uh, I'll be the, I would love to see that being used in people with low-grade brain tumours or even high-grade brain tumours to perhaps prevent prevention, uh, progression. Um, and that's, we, that's in, 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 in mind. We, we really are waiting for that development to happen. The guys I'm working with in Brisbane are in um, cooperation with a vaccine uh, group in Europe and they're working on the vaccine as we speak. So he told me by the middle of this year or the end of the next year they'll have a trial vaccine ready to go and that, that I'd love to be able to then extend that into a, a brain tumour trial. But it's an excellent question actually. Thanks. Um, oh sorry, I, I haven't heard anything t 
today about the impact of telecommunications and mm -hmm. is that an urban myth or has mean, there been any phones, research? So is there, well, not just yeah. that. I mean, when I yes, turn my Wi-Fi on of an yeah. evening, there's 25 Wi-Fi's <coughs> belting around the place. Oh. So I wouldn't restrict it to mobile phones. So I'd call it technology, okay. but well, I'd I mean, like I, to I'll hear from the experts. I, I, have, I think it's, there's no evidence that it has any role. Um, some people make outlandish statements from time to time and, you know, spread fear throughout the community and... Um, Whatever, but I'd, lo I'd love to hear others' opinion. James, what's your, what's your view? There's absolutely no data that the use of cell phones or other technologies increases the risk of brain tumors. I think also recently the WHO said that coffee had something to do with it as well. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are there are lots of. Um, <laughs> Do you guys have any other different views? I know. I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah. I don't think there's any evidence for it. Yeah. Is that because it the hasn't been done yet? No, it's, it's been, been done. It's been done. It's been done. It's yeah. been done fairly. Been done to death. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> and on a phone caused brain cancer. You can cure it with Reiki, apparently. So. <laughs> But on a biological model, uh, after an exposure of radi radiation, it's about 10 to 15 years before a tumour may develop. So we have to go back, when did mobile phones come in and where was the increased use? And we've been more than 10 or 15 years experience with mobile phones now. We weren't five or 10 years ago, but now we are, and we're not seeing a huge rise in brain tumour. So I think that's the data which is probably most reassuring, especially given the original mobile phones were quite <coughs> leaky in terms of their electromagnetic radiation. Well, there's no association epidemiologically with those professions, as far as I understand. But, there um, was a cluster in the US with um, the guys that changed the fuel on the jets, because when you heat that up to high concentrations, it emits a whole lot of toxins. But they found it was what we call a cluster rather than there was any direct association. So we see clusters. Um, like the breast cancer patients, um, you know, working in the ABC or whatever. But when you actually try and validate it statistically, it's it's anecdotal rather than evidence-based. I think in some respects it would be great if, if you're looking at this, the future testing in terms of vaccination, uh, I think it's very important that you notify people to, to get them totally aware of it. I do have a malignant brain tumour, but I'm getting sick and tired. I've had it for 22 bloody years and I'm still here. <laughs> so I'm quite happy to keep on doing any testing whatsoever that comes into it. I, uh, I do have a little bit of a different opinion than Dr. Walker. Um, I think it's fascinating kind of oncogenesis, but I think that glioblastoma cells are just a good home for this cytomegalovirus, I think more than 90% of us have this virus in us all the time. It's one of the herpes viruses, just like uh, chickenpox, just like herpes simplex. And the cytomegalovirus finds that cell abnormal. It can hide in that cell from the immune system. So it's a great place to live. But what Dr. Mitchell did was take it as an advantage, and it's also a good way to immunize against that tumor cell whether it's involved in the development of it. I don't think we have quite enough data, but I do think we need to take advantage of it. We probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. yeah. 